how long can a virus keep attacking me, especially when I've been previously infected? How long do my antibodies survive in my blood? How long does a vaccine defend my immune system against an intruder? Scientists are grappling with these questions, and we have yet to find out for certain how long vaccine protection lasts. Welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones. Thanks for joining. Now, since the pandemic started, we're all hoping to regain the freedoms we enjoyed before the global crisis. In countries with low infection rates, people who are fully vaccinated or who fully recovered from COVID-19 can travel, go to restaurants, museums, theatres or nightclubs. And that is because they're thought to be immune to the virus and less likely to pass it on to others. But can we trust our immune system and our immune response against SARS-CoV-2? And if so, for how long? How long do people who've had a mild or moderate case of COVID-19 remain immune? Lübeck University researchers teamed up with the local health authority to find out. They examined the blood of more than 400 volunteers at varying intervals. We wanted to find out what the immune response was and how best to study it. In the blood, you find the antibodies as well as the T lymphocytes, which are part of the immune system and are very important for the development of antibodies. T lymphocytes, or T cells, are white blood cells, essential in activating a variety of immune responses. With enough antibodies and T cells in your blood, you're protected against infections. Most of the patients developed antibodies after about four weeks of infection. That was easy to detect. Within the next two months, the antibodies increased and peaked, and then dropped off slowly again over time. But after about ten months, around half the antibodies were still there. So, we can assume that for at least the 10 months of our study, those patients were protected. The researchers expect immunity to last for over a year. They say the same is true for those who've been vaccinated against COVID-19. From all the data gathered in between times, we now know that the creation of antibodies after the vaccination is in principle comparable to having had the infection, but without having to suffer the consequences of the illness. So our results are in this respect transferable to the results one would have after a vaccination. That means those who are vaccinated are immune for at least 10 months and with a strong immune system, possibly much longer. This is, of course, a further incentive for people to get vaccinated. And naturally, that's something we from the health department support and promote, because it's one of the most effective ways out of this pandemic. The study also shows that after some time, booster shots will be needed, as with the annual influenza vaccination. Professor Miles Davenport is head of the Infection Analytics Programme at the University of New South Wales, and he joins us now. Good to have you with us. Um, so I guess the first question uh, would definitely have to be, I mean, when it comes to the level of immunity against SARS-CoV-2, does it actually matter whether you recovered from COVID-19 or whether you got vaccinated? Uh, the level of antibodies that you see um, varies quite a lot between different vaccines. So the stronger vaccines um, give about fourfold higher antibody levels than uh, natural infection, and the weaker vaccines give around half the antibody levels that you see in natural infection. So there's quite a, a variability. Right. But there's also a difference between falling seriously ill with COVID-19 and uh, just having mild symptoms. Does this also reflect in the level of antibodies? It does seem that people that have had more severe infection um, develop larger immune responses afterwards. Um, but that's not quite as a big a difference as, for example, the strong vaccines versus the weak vaccines in terms of the, the antibody level. 
Do we know already how long people who either recovered or get vaccinated actually remain immune to SARS-CoV-2? Because there's already talk about booster shots uh, given maybe half a year after being fully uh, vaccinated. Does this mean that basically we cease to be immune after six months? Well, there's a very recent study um, from the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which just came out looking at uh, the level of protection that vaccine gives. And they claimed 96% protection within the first two months, 90% between two and four months and dropping to 84% beyond four months. But one thing that I would emphasize here is that that's measuring susceptibility to any symptomatic infection. So much of that infection um, might be very mild. And we expect that protection from severe infection uh, will be much longer lasting because you require a lower immune response to protect from severe infection. Uh, because you just mentioned uh, that study by BioNTech, uh, Pfizer, uh, when we talk about the booster shot, uh, does this only apply to mRNA vaccines or would this apply to all the other ones as well? Uh, so... There's been quite a lot of work uh, looking at boosting people who've been previously infected. Um, and that shows that boosting can give probably a four times higher antibody level um, in a previously infected person compared to a naive person. Uh, there's more limited studies in boosting vaccine responses, uh, but you can probably use any vaccine to boost um, and it will be, it may have again that difference in the strength of the effect but there's no reason um, why you couldn't use any vaccine to boost. Uh, when we talk about those antibody levels, I mean, how many antibodies do we actually need to have? How many antibodies are healthy? Can there be a level that is way too high? Uh, I don't think there's a level that's way too high. The way that we measure um, the antibodies uh, commonly is to look at their ability to neutralize the virus. So that's by taking the virus itself and cells um, in culture and looking at how much of a patient serum, for example, you need to add to block infection. And that's what we'd call the neutralizing TETA of antibodies, the concentration you need to add. As far as we know, um, there's probably no such thing as too, uh, too many antibodies to the virus. Um, so I don't think that's a risk. Okay. Uh, I mean, we do hear about people uh catching that virus, SARS-CoV-2, a second time, after, even after they've been vaccinated or even after they fully uh, recovered. So what kind of responses are necessary to provide protective immunity against this virus? Uh, I think it's perhaps, uh, again, again, important to define what you mean by protective immunity. Um, so there's protection from becoming infected and there's protection from severe infection. And so far, it seems that these neutralizing antibodies and the level of neutralizing antibodies is very predictive of protection uh, from infection. Uh, but even if the strongest vaccines, they have an efficacy around 95%, so still 5% of people will get infected, but most of those will have a very mild illness. Um, and, and we hope that that protection from severe infection will be long lasting. It's perhaps worth drawing a parallel uh, with influenza virus, where the virus circulates uh, in the community every year, and most people get infected quite often every few years because of exposure. However, severe infection is fairly rare in the community because we all have uh, sufficient protection. And it's quite likely that with um, SARS-CoV-2, the same thing will happen, that we can expect that infection will be ongoing but hopefully most people will be protected from the more severe effects. Yeah, we all hope the same. Professor uh, Davian Port there from the University of New South Wales. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So a vaccine tricks our body into thinking it's under attack, thus producing antibodies. But what else are vaccines doing to us? Time to ask Derek. What systems exist in the EU for the ongoing monitoring of vaccine side effects? The central authority responsible for, for recommending and monitoring vaccines in the European Union is the European Medicines Agency, or, or EMA, which was set up to harmonize 
these kinds of activities in the block. Um, the vaccines greenlighted so far in a conditional market approval in the EU are now in what's often called a phase four, when a vaccine is rolled out to the public on a wide scale. But even after that happens, uh, clinical trials continue and, and the vaccines are monitored closely for years. The monitoring tracks long-term effectiveness, of course, but it's also set up to identify any adverse reactions or other potential dangers that were missed in earlier large-scale trials. So, so what's called a pharmacovigilance system is in place. It's, it's pretty complex, but also pretty tightly networked. And, and the agency says it helps any reports from patients and from healthcare professionals um, to be analyzed extensively. A lot of people distrust information issued directly by pharmaceutical companies when it comes to how safe and effective they say their products are. Um, to assuage that distrust and help promote transparency, uh, the EMA set up its own network and management system for, for tracking suspected side effects of, of not just vaccines, but of any medication approved in the EU. Um, the European database is called UDRA Vigilance. Um, in it, you can read any reports of suspected adverse vaccine effects on a, on a country by country basis. And it's updated every week. So if you're interested and want to see what's being reported firsthand, I urge you to take a look. It's really informative and, and it's easy to use. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching. 